Welcome everybody to Dat Poker Podcast, episode 133. This is October 18th, 2022. I'm your host, Dave Schwartz, alongside Roscoe P. Coltrane. So she won this championship by having the balls to make a gamble. The championship that she won, absolutely. Uh, Terrence Chen, how are you, sir? Good. I mean, just I wish I had the balls to win the championship on the river the way that the that Robbie did, you know, it's the, yeah, the, the, of all the, of all the horrible things that have come out of this is like the, the, the weird coming out of people who don't otherwise give two shits about poker or understand it in any way, just coming out and being like, yeah, she really, she really beat that poker guy. Yeah. And I don't remember whether a flush beats a full house, but boy, she does. Yeah. Oh, I know. Uh, Daniel, was that the worst take you saw on this whole thing? Oh, no, there was worse. I mean, like you said, the mainstream takes have been phenomenal. And you have these otherwise really smart people. And it's sort of like a an exercise in understanding the Dunning-Kruger effect. Because you're smart at one thing doesn't mean you know anything yeah. about everything else. Because yeah. you had this woman who's like an MIT student or teacher or something, <laughs> like making it a fully... Um, you know, uh, se- what do you call it? Sexism issue or whatever. And she did this whole tree. She built like a game tree with statistics and math. And it actually checks out except for the fact that like, it includes the idea that you know exactly what your opponent has. And if you do check for it's a call, <laughs> it's like, you literally just kind of prove cheating, but you don't get it. The mainstream takes, and I actually, you know, to Robbie or whoever, I would say, you know, the biggest thing you need to shade away from is this idea that you like, I just own this guy. It was a soul read. Like, let's not go down that road. Let's just be real with what we are presenting, which is either A, you know, you sort of misread your hand, you were flustered in the situation, but to go down that road of like, yeah, the men are just all mad because woman took their money and won the tournament. Was, yeah, that's <laughs> no, it. Yeah. Let's, let's all I call think... it the tournament from now on, even though everybody who actually plays poker knows the championship, it's a actually. Let's, yeah, let's just all call it the championship, even though it's just some random cash game on a Monday. Okay, we'll update the championship later. We've got more important fish to fry. First off, uh, been a couple weeks. Daniel, um, you are back. Are we allowed to? Is it an undisclosed location you were? Or can we talk about well, the it? The place What's where the... you're too old to get into a bar is, I believe, <laughs> the place. Yeah, you... so that was funny. All right, I was in Korea. Went and visited a good buddy of mine I haven't seen in 13 years, Tyson, who I used to play, you know, know from Toronto days and whatnot. And, you know, some other things I was there for business-wise. And we went, you know, we're out, you know, we're having some drinks. We go to this, we see, we're looking around in this fun little par- area in Seoul. And we're like, oh, that, that place looks cool, right? It's a Waikiki Beach Club. So we walk up to it and they say, you know, can we see ID? And I'm like, of course, you know, I got to I'm surprised they ID me, but listen, I'll ID me. And then they look at me and say, no, 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 85. So what? Too old. <laughs> we were all too old to get it. You had to be born in 1985 or younger. It was awesome. I, apparently in Korea, they have... Um, some places that don't allow foreigners and they do like, you know, obviously by ageism and there's other ones that like, whether you're good looking enough or not. So like, it was really interesting being there, you know, just in terms of like the cultural differences um, in, in that regard. And uh, we just, me, Ali and, you know, and, and the boys, we, we found it pretty damn funny, honestly. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, all right, let's jump into it. Before you did jump on a plane and head over to South Korea to what, work on the North Korea, South Korea thing, probably a little yep, bit. That's correct. Uh, you played in a little poker tournament uh, called the Super High Roller Bowl. Do you recall this at all? I do. And I, I'm going to lead into that. I'm going to but a while I was playing the Super High Roller Bowl and they have my phone. All this shit was going on with the dice, the heist, the hustler stuff, and this and that. Then I get out on a plane and I'm in Korea on a different time zone doing this other thing. And in that time, Alex Jacob came at me with the most bizarre barrage of Twitter tweets to this guy saying that I'm like, oh, I jumped ship, bro. I'm on team cheating now. I'm like, because I didn't comment on it. And for me, I would have been really irresponsible to not know what the fuck I was talking about and comment on something. So I asked for cliffs, much like you did earlier today about, you know, the latest, you know, happenings. But yeah, super high roller bowl. I was zoned in, focused. I can say without question, it was the single best performance of my tournament career by a mile. I felt like I, I went in with, you know, busting the other one where I bubbled in the 50K and said, I'm going to dominate this event. How are they going to get my chips? And I was chip leader early on, held on to it and went almost wire to wire, never all in, you know, never in jeopardy, never in doubt, you really calm, cool, collected. And I did so by implementing some, I call them advanced strategies, but they're GTO busters, bro. <laughs> I literally, I feel like I broke the Sims because 
I came with a lot of limping, some different sizes for my opens, C-bet sizing, sizes across the board. So um, the lesson there, I guess, for a lot of people is no human being is ever going to implement GTO properly. It's not possible. So everyone has tendencies and flaws that they're implementing improperly, especially if they're only studying very specific sizes. So if they're only studying third pot, two thirds and 1.5 X, and you use sizes that are not in accordance with that, well, you make their head scratch a little bit, especially when you add limping ranges, because limping ranges, most people don't solve with limping ranges because it makes it way more complex to, to create it. So the most people don't even bother with it. And I've been limping for 30 years, so I knew how to do that. And I got to say, it was more, I mean, I was dabbling with it at Poker Masters and didn't have much, I, I was having some success with it, just wasn't winning the all-ins. But luckily in Super High Roll Bowl, we're deep enough that I never had to be all in. So how am I going to lose if you can't put me all in? You, you know, when you say that, you know, you you have an advantage because you've been limping for 30 years, so you know how those pots play better. That So that's you saying you're drawing on the experience instead, of, like you haven't actually studied what what range versus range looks like when you live into a pot and, you know, big blind checks and stuff like that. You haven't actually studied it. You're just going by field by the seat of your pants. Playing again, I'm using my own internal randomizer, which is, you know, 30 years of experience, as you said. But like what what it does, it puts me on a level playing field in the regard of like, um, you know, well, actually, it doesn't put me on a level playing field. It puts me on one foot up because even if like if, if nobody studied it and I've been doing it for 30 years, well, it's going to give me an advantage because people played. They made a lot of key mistakes against it, you know, like um, where I was really able to exploit, especially in position. I want to ask you about so uh, specific players and if you're willing to talk about them um, that maybe can play, can adapt to something like that versus the solver crew that maybe, you know, studies their ass off to play GTO and, and figure, figure out all the, you know, different situations. But are there people like yourself, do you think, that play in those tournaments that can can adapt to something like that better than others i, I guess there are that. two guys who do it as well carry Katz is you know known to be a limper and he knows what he's doing in these spots like i think he does a couple things a little bit sloppy but he limps you know he, he he's he's been a limper for quite a while and the other one that limps occasionally i've seen is chance corneth who also imposes like a mild limp strategy um but other than those i don't think that there are obviously spots see the thing is when you have a big blind Andy and you're playing three-handed for example you need to play the button a lot, right? A lot, because you're getting a really good price. So the question is, if you're going to play it a lot and you're raising a lot, well, you open yourself up, right, to being three bet and pushed off the hand. So what you need to do really is to add an extra limping range, especially when you're deep, right, so that you can see flops with 10-8 offsuit. Like if you're raising, if you're opening two and a half, two X with like every 10-8 off that you get, like you're going to get three bet a lot and pushed off the pot. Whereas you limp with some of these hands, sometimes you'll have to fold, but a lot of times... You can limp call with some of these hands, and then you're playing 70, 80 big blinds deep, and they got to go first. A perfect example of this, okay, was on the bubble. I think it was on the bubble or pretty close. I had the ace five of clubs, and I'm good in chips. I'm not worried, right? I have the bubble. I have ace five of clubs. I decide to limp on the button Justin for 50K. Justin Bonomo makes it like 200K, so he makes it 4X from the small. He has the ace 10 of hearts. I, of course, call. Comes king deuce four of spades. He does what the solver tells you, which is bet really small in these spots, quarter pot. And he's got 700 in his stack. I make it 200. So essentially, I'm forcing him to continue with a very limited range of hands. What does he do with two red tens? What does he do with ace jack of hearts? What do he do with ace ten of hearts? What does he do with anything that doesn't have a spade in it? What if he does have a spade and it's not a big spade? It's like, essentially, I'm putting him in a spot where for the 200K... I'm asking for his entire stack. I'm requesting it, as Ali Najad would say. But uh, I don't have to risk the whole 700, because obviously if he just moves in on the flop, I can fold, because the range that moves in has me destroyed. And I have some equity with ace-five of clubs, right? I still can hit a three. You know, Some of the time I have the best hand, probably hardly ever. But the point is, is that's a hand where if I would have opened, like a normal person does, he probably just re-raises and I've got to fold. Uh, Terrence and I were watching the turn, uh, watching the broadcast and, uh, chatting back and forth a little bit. And, uh, there was a spot we were both kind of, well, Terrence brought it up and we were just trying to talk it through a little bit. And it was when you guys were three handed, it was you, Nick and Chewy. And I believe you had 5 million and they both had 1 million. So sort of a horrible ICM spot for both of them there when you're, when you've got them in that, in that spot. And I think, um, you were, in, you know, we were wondering, is this a better spot to you just, 
if you're going to play a hand, move in and force them to play for that. Uh, so, yeah, there were a know, couple times specifically. I, I don't, you know, and I had the hands written down, and I, I don't have them right now. But there were there were spots where there was a there was a hand where uh, you know you limped from the small with with some fairly raggedy hand, and then you know he was able. I think was it Nick on your left, or is it Chewy on your left? Yeah, Nick was on my left. Nick was on your left. Yeah, and and he was able to take the pot from me a couple times. A couple times, you know, you, you you had you had a raising hand, and you know what you just talked about. You said you know they they three bet shove because that's kind of their only move at that point, they, they have to kind of play for stacks and you're only about 20 big blind deeps. And like you said, with the big blind ante, you know, you can pick up two and a half big blinds. Um, it seemed like the spot where you could just, uh, you could just really whittle them down by opening open jamming really wide. Of course, there's a risk to that, you know, when they wake up with a hand, they double through, uh, and you can't get away because you've, you've open jammed. But uh, I was interesting because, you know, I haven't really studied these ICM spots and I assume you have, I, I'm curious what the solver says and whether, whether this is a, a an attempt to exploit or is this actually like, is that just, is 20 bigs actually just too much to shove considering they, like they can't call you except with, with really big hands at that point. Yeah, it's definitely, I've never studied ICM or anything like that. So okay. I, I can't give you the solver outputs on that because I just don't give a shit. I play to win. Um, but having said that, you know, there's a couple functions. I like the situation. I kind of wanted to keep it the way that it was, right? So one of the risks you run is, you know, by jamming, jamming, jamming. Sure, you pick up chips that way. But, you know, when you get it in, you're probably pretty dead or you're going to be like 30 percent equity and 70 percent of the time you're going to double somebody up, you know, and now put them in a good position with like 40 big blinds or something like that. So you can almost, you know, create a similar effect by opening for like two and a half to three X and then they jam. But they're only going to be they're not going to be jamming light. Right. Because of the situation they're in, you know, sometimes you, you, you know, you maybe had a hand that you could have called because you had enough equity. But overall, they're still going to play close to the same ranges for two and a half as they are for the 20. So I'm essentially giving myself an out so I don't double them up like too freely. And also both of those guys, while they're ICM aware and ICM conscious, they're also not wimpy. Like they, they understand that here's the thing. They understand that both of them are ICM aware. So it's not a spot where if like you're playing with some amateur and they're like, they're just going to torch it. So you're going to move up and win a million and you cannot wait them. Like they right. know they have to play. So my idea was like, I was really trying to whittle them down slowly, but surely um, without playing any all in pots. And that's probably partly because I have PTSD big time and it hasn't gone away just because I won that tournament. I have major all in PTSD. I'm going to go see somebody about it. <laughs> I just, yeah, I was just thinking about a spot where, so, so like, for example, um, if you were to open with, with a hand, like ace deuce or something like that, and, and say Nick is there in the small blind, he could reshove on you if he's got, if he's got like a, a a king jack or something like that, but that's a spot where, where it's super I gross. I don't think I don't think there's a world where he's shoving that light. Really? If I'm raising really? Ace Deuce and he's got they're on twenty bigs, I don't think they're shoving twenty bigs with a with king jack. Maybe some of the time, but even if they are, like, what am I really giving up here? Right? I'm giving up like a spot that that's like a coin flip. No, but if up. you had open jammed, they would have just like got got the fuck right. out of the way, right? Right. Yeah. So what am I risking by raising and letting him do it? Obviously, if I open jam. I win the two and a half blinds and this way I lose the two and a half blinds. But in the bigger pick, you know, in the bigger scope of things, I'm still in control and I'm not at risk for mm -hmm. any big stacks. Like I'm never going to put, I was never putting 20 big blinds in like with 20, 30% equity. I was like, you know, going to whittle them down and, and, you know, wait for the spots. And listen, it's hard when you're three handed for them to get hands good enough to like be, be re jamming against me, you know, yeah. in the ICM spot that was created. Uh, I want to go back to what you said uh, earlier, Daniel, about uh, you had it in your mindset, uh, you know, that you were going to dominate this tournament and uh, and give it your all. And and yeah, it's one of the biggest events you're going to play, obviously, 300K buy-in. Um, do, you, do you think you were more focused for this specific tournament or do you think about that every time? Because, you're, you know, you're generally playing tournaments with 10K or higher buy-in. So, um, you know, and obviously it's still relatively a large amount of money. So I'm sure you're focused and, and want to win all of them, but this one seemed like you made a point to say specifically that you were, you were going to take control of this one. You know, the funny thing is, I think if people watched the entirety of it, they'd be like, man, is he paying attention at all? Cause it like would appear as though I wasn't focused. Cause I was doing a lot of table talk and I was engaged and I was really being in my comfort zone, which maybe makes other people a little bit, you know, uncomfortable, a little bit of old school type stuff like that. Um, but no, certainly I, um, I came into the event very confident, I would say, like I left that 50 K and I felt like I played really well when I bubbled with aces against jacks and I was really, you know, finding that the limp strategy was really working. And I'm like, I'm going to bring this to super high rollable and we're going to be really, really deep. 
100 big blinds deep plus for most of the tournament. And I just felt like I really did. I went in like thinking like very like confidently saying, how are they going to get me? Like for them to get all of my chips is going to be difficult. I didn't, I don't play the same style as someone like an Adamo who, you know, he's playing for stacks every pot, you know, every, every chance he get, he's looking for six, seven X pot. I'm not, you know, I went very much the other way, you know, in a frust, and it's probably frustrating to a certain degree too, like playing against that style that I have, uh, that's different than Adamo because I'm always there always hanging around, but how are you going to get me? You know? And I played like a very solid defense throughout in spots where, and I also did so with understanding how it affects my ranges on different streets. Right. So it also affected my raising ranges on rivers and different things like that because of the way that I was playing. Um, I really just thought deeply about each node, you know, like the, the, in each line, like the check, check lines to the river, like how strong do I want to be in these spots? And, um, I felt like I bobbed and weaved and like the only jeopardy I was in was one hand against Alex Foxen where I had jacks and he had aces and I got away on the river. And that's the big thing I noticed too. Like I watched it back and I was really, I was shocked at how many good spots that you're supposed to call. Solver says call, but I folded and I was right. Like just a simple thing where three handed Nick raises, I call with ace, 10 of clubs in the big comes queen, eight deuce check fold, you know? So you're supposed to peel, right? But I was avoiding situations out of position that would put me in bad spots on later streets. Is that something like you think you can replicate well going forward? Like, you know, when you play your next five tournaments, say whenever they happen, do you think you'll be able to go back at the stream and just like, how often do you think you'll, you'll just be right when you make those exploitive folds, those folds that aren't by the book, you know, do you think you can be right? Like 70, 80% of the time, even better it doesn't than even that matter on, it doesn't even matter like how right I am because it's like, it's hard to explain this one, but. I'm super looking forward to the WPT, which is tomorrow. I'm playing the five diamond. And it's a deep, deepish style structure. And I'm like, I can't wait to like sort of implement what I'm doing against maybe a slightly below average or slightly, you know, lower caliber player than I'm used to. Um, but your question was, uh, oh, can I implement it? Yeah, no, I definitely think so. Um, I definitely think that like going for the only difference, like with the strategy that I'm implementing, this isn't something I'm doing. Like I saw Mike Mattiso tweet. And I'm like, this is not the same thing. I'm not limping off 15 bigs like or eight bigs like Helmuth is, you know. I mean, he there's some strat, there's some actual, you know, um, theory that backs doing that though. Like a lot of guys do that off 20 or less. I'm not one to do that. I like to limp. I'm limping deeper with the number one intention is see more flops. So when I'm limping with king queen or ace five suited and stuff like that, I don't have to fold to a three bet. I can limp call. And then because my range is quite wide when I'm limp calling, it does put the other position, especially if they're doing it out of position. Like if they're, ra if they're raising from the blinds and letting me have position in these spots, there's just a lot of boards that I can credibly represent and I can do so aggressively. And I got position, you know? So it's like, it feels like a, it sounds like a wimpy, weak way to play, but it's so power poker to me. It's absolute pot control. It's like I decide what happens on every street. I decide how big the pots are. I decide the metagame. I can adjust the metagame as I choose. And it just felt like complete control. So I'm looking forward to doing that again at the five diamond and really just kind of trying to break people's brains a little bit with it. Because again, it's my comfort zone. I'm playing a style and a system that I know works. And so, you know, people, here's the thing learning theory is really important guys. Like if you want to be a good poker player, you got to learn theory, but understand one thing. You'll never implement it perfectly and nobody else will either. So find out what people are learning, find out where there are exploits and things that they do. That might be a mis That might be something you can just exploit. Even if they are playing what they deem to be GTO with a lot of the little dinky bets, you know, the quarter pot and 20% pot bets on flops. Like even though GTO, you know, GTO says that's good. And it's fine, but you're not GTO and you're not a computer and you don't realize what that's going to create for you on later streets in terms of problems against wider ranges. A, a solver can, you can't, you can't. So I tend to like, I tend to find that, you know, sort of the, the metagame, the way that it is right now in a deeper stack structure in tournaments that I'm going to crush. I'm going to absolutely dominate for sure. Uh, thoughts on the field size or the event in general, I guess field size, uh, 24 uh, entries, um, you end up winning 3.3 million for first. Uh, I think back in this is your second biggest uh, score of your career. Of course, you finished second in the $1 million one drop in 2014. Um, but 
Uh, back in when I think it was 2018, when you finished second to Justin Bonomo in the Super High Roller Bowl, you won just about the same amount of money for finishing second. Obviously, more people in it. Um, or, or is there an issue with field size here, or um, is it a spot in the in the schedule or something that affected it? Do you think? Actually, the field size was up from last year. Last year, I think they had 21. This year, they had 23 or 24. Oh, um, good, right? I, yeah. Yeah. The issue there is simple, because that that event happens in Las Vegas. The entire Asian contingent that would play, they can't because of that issue they had with Caesars. Then you have the Canadians who don't play because of the tax situation. So you're missing out probably, you know, 15 to 20 players that would also bring more. So that's probably one of the main reasons. Overall, the Poker Masters attendance was fine. What hasn't been fine since then? You know, I'm back from Korea and I went to the Bellagio and I played a couple of PLOs. The fields for these Bellagio high rollers that they're having have been horrendous. I mean, we're talking like, five players to 18 players total that's with re-entry you know the, the field size have been really really bad and i think there's a couple reasons for that number one is competition there's events going on at the win there's world series of poker online there's you know events in europe and things like that so maybe not scheduled well but also it's at the bellagio and people don't want to play at the bellagio right it's not quite like what you find at other places in las vegas and i have a little list here that i was going to share real quick Hold on here. I had it here. Um, so like the Bellagio was the pinnacle, right? Bellagio was the place to play. It was, hang on, I know it's up here. Oh, whatever. Yeah, when I started playing poker, my first trip that I got to play in the Bellagio, it, the, the, you, could, you could sense like the energy. I mean, I was there playing like 816 Limit Hold'em. But you look around the room and, you know, your dream as, a, as an up and coming poker player is to be in that, that, upper, uh, that upper area, that high limit area. And uh, We played in a table in this high roller in the corner next to all the slot machines and the smoke coming by at, at tables that are cramped in where you can't really move. And the table they had us on like was too small for eight handed. It was like, a, it was a six max table or something. It was just really bad. It's, it's like crazy to see how it's fallen. So I'm going to give you my short list real quick of places that I've played in Las Vegas. There's a couple that I haven't. So I don't know. Number one place to play poker in Las Vegas. If you can, it's the experience you want to have is in the poker go studio. Obviously, this requires higher buy-ins, but it is going to be the best poker playing experience you'll find in Las Vegas by a long shot. Number two, the win. The win is crushing it, okay? The win is doing a fantastic job with their tournament series. The, the, the facility is great. The tables are spread apart. The room is really nice. Thirdly, I'm going with Paris at the WSOP. Bally's is, you know, a little lower end, but like if you played on the Paris side on day ones and stuff like that, very nice place to play. Then I move over to the Aria. You know, the Aria poker room is decent. You know, it's, it's okay. Um, then you got the Venetian, which has a nice room, but they've got other problems with their guarantees and things like that. And then you've got one, one that I haven't played at is Resorts, but I've heard amazing reviews. Resorts is supposed to be like the nuts. And then at the very bottom, by a wide margin now, is Bellagio. In terms of amenities, facilities, like um, restaurants, accessibility, like the room itself is cramped and it's, you know, loud and... It's right next to the, 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 you know, it's a sort of a plus minus that it's next to the sports book and the race book. Like that's a good thing in that like it brings traffic, but it's also really fucking loud and smoky, you know? So not, not ideal playing at Bellagio. So you got the Orleans ahead of the Bellagio, dude? <laughs> I was just about to say Orleans. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. I haven't played there in a long time, but I would imagine I have the Orleans ahead of them. Can we do like top, top five worst places you've ever played? <laughs> I'll have to think about that. But I remember one of the first ones was in London. And the ceilings were about seven feet tall. And this was way back when everybody smoked like a chain. And I played a tournament. I lasted one hour. And I literally, truly busted myself because I couldn't take it anymore. I just said, I'm all in. I have to go. Couldn't well, one of the things you mentioned, you know, you mentioned playing in the Poker, Poker Go studios and also playing at Paris. And even though you haven't played their resorts world, one, one critical thing about these three places is they're all separate from the casino floor. All three of those poker rooms are not like stuck in the casino floor like you you have a poker room like aria like it is it's separate area but you're still going to have drifting smoke in from the rest of the casino because it's definitely like oh that, the but. one other place i didn't mention but it has nostalgia and i swear to you i get goosebumps when i walk by it if i'm ever there which is where is the mirage because the mirage is historic for me that is where i started mm -hmm. that is like i love the room the vibe the dark of the dark bit of it the show would get out and people would come in and play and it is in the center of the entire casino and uh yeah the mirage was like 
very special to my heart, but obviously it's not a place that has it's like, well, it's like the Bellagio is for me. Cause I'm, I'm about like four or five years younger than you. My career is a little bit younger than yours. For me, that was a Bellagio. It's where like every, where you played when you got to Vegas. And yeah. if you wanted to be somebody, you played at the Bellagio and, and in your day it was the Mirage. So it, it is interesting. These things go through evolutions. Maybe poker players now are thinking of, of resorts world, right? That's where the biggest cash games are right now. So yeah. I even like playing at the freaking smell. It smelled like urine and I loved it. It was Minions Horseshoe with gum on the sidewalks and dirt everywhere. And we'd sit on the floor and cigarette butts. It was like, ah, this is poker, baby. We think yeah. it's changed. <laughs> oh, and those old gross chips at the Horseshoe. Now they, they were, were disgusting. I don't think they ever washed them. There was, was gum like, on them. You know the them. chips? The chips at the Horseshoe, like they sort of decreased, decreased, decreased in size. Where yes. like normal, they were just, they were disintegrating. They were just like melting away <laughs> from dirt. It was crazy. They didn't even stack properly anymore because they were so worn down. Like, you know, you put them in 20 chip stacks oh, yeah. and it's stack to be leaning because there's no edges. Well, left you couldn't them. even rack them properly, right? Because you put 20 yeah. chips in a rack, but I'm like, some of them would fit like 22 chips. And some <laughs> of them only 18. It was like so bad. <laughs> it was the worst. Uh, all right, uh, back to the uh, uh, the prize pool there. So 3.3 million, you end up taking down. Now this, you know, we're late in 2022. You haven't had a great... Uh, uh, year up until this point, I think it's well documented. You've been, uh, you know, and, and now with social media and stuff, you can have your uh, outlets and you talk more and you're more open about um, what you're going through in poker and stuff. And we're all doing that, I think. And, uh, but, um, you know, you turn a, a year where you're down maybe 1.6 million to a year where now you're up 1.6 million with a couple of months left. And, and when we look at back at your uh, previous years, uh, you're quite open with your results. You've got, uh, I look back, you've only got two losing years here in the last uh, nine years, uh, 2017, 2018. So back to back years, or sorry, 16 and 17, back to back years where, you know, 17, you were basically break even, 16, yeah. you lose 1.2. Um, and, you, you know, like I said, you've been sort of open with your frustration with how, uh, you know, your, your PTSD with all ins and, and uh, running bad, et cetera. And I wonder back to, if you want to think back to, 2016 17 where you know you have two losing years there or is there a specific tournament that uh you know maybe a million dollar one drop i can't remember exactly yeah there was a bunch of big tournaments i have the list or whatever but there was like a there, there yeah. was like a lot of 100ks and million dollar buy-ins and as you said you know i lost like 1.2 one year at 2016 and 2017 i think it was a 60k or something like that at the stakes i was playing that is about as break even as you can get considering it was yeah. my average buy-in i'm down like one buy-in right so yeah, about break even there. But a lot of it was a function of two things. One was, um, you know, buy-ins. Just there was a lot of big buy-ins. And two, I wasn't as good as I am now. And I think it was a period right before I sort of went down, you know, some study and some improvements in my game where I just wasn't, you know, there was a lot of good players at the time that were just better than me. And I don't think I was quite as good. So, you know, anytime that happens, I take a look introspectively i don't need twitter to tell me daniel daniel you need to do this i know what i'm doing you know i've always been i've always been good at reading when i'm like i think this is a poker skill that you need to have when you play at a table like and you're losing you're not going well like is it you or are these guys just better than you right so i ask myself several key questions number one you know am i getting so short that every time i get it in i have like eight big blinds no am i bluffing it off no am i calling it off no am i getting it in really really bad you know 30 percent no so why am I busting with decent stacks all these times? Getting it in two to one favorite and losing. And like that's been going on for me for a year and a bit and it hasn't changed. But like, and that's why I have the PTSD. But listen, all these things, and I've been playing 30 years and I could say confidently, I've never seen anything like this, but it'll, it'll change. It'll flip. And when it does, I feel like I'm going to have a really good run in 2000, the rest of this year in 2023. Uh, nice. All right. So uh, let's go back and just uh, quick. I know, you know, we're going to talk about the uh, Robbie J. Lou Garrett Adelstein championship and, uh, and, and go from <laughs> there and give, well give it a little bit of a recap. Now, obviously, uh, if you want to get di a deep dive into what's going on and all the minutia and the ellipses and all the different things that are happening that might uh, in lie detector tests and different things like that. Um, you can catch Joey because Joey Ingram is doing a uh, podcast on this with all kinds of interesting characters. Joey He's got gets, a free 14 hours to spare every day. I don't know how he does it. I, the guy goes, leaves poker for six, seven months or a year, whatever, and then comes back. And now he's doing 10 hours a day on one hand, which is awesome. And, but fascinating all at the same time. Um, and, but he's got a lot of the people that are involved. He's had, you know, pretty much everybody, I think, other than the guy who uh, we'll talk about who ended up stealing some money from Robbie stack, but, 
Um, and even him, I think he agreed to come on, but then bailed at the last minute or something. Anyways, uh, if you want to get deep into it, uh, head on over to Joey's uh, uh, YouTube channel if you want to kill three, four days to, to watch the video. Um, but, uh, you know, just as a high sort of level recap, you guys did a great job, um, you know, talking about it uh, in the previous show. But, um, you know, since then, there's been, uh, a, you know, a couple of um, things that have come out. And one of them was... Uh, the cameras were rolling and high stakes or sorry, um, Hustler Casino Live pledged to uh, bring in uh, an investigative team and, and, you know, get to the bottom of anything. Uh, security teams find out to make sure their secure, their stream was secure, et cetera. Um, and uh, one of the things that they immediately came out with before they released sort of the findings of the, of the full investigation that they're doing is that they discovered one of the employees of, high, of Hustler Casino Live uh, on the stream of the night of the infamous hand um, is seen on camera stealing $15,000 from this, from the chip stack of Robbie J. Lou. Uh, while that she was away from the table and maybe uh, others were as well, um, he ends up rolling in stealing 15,000. So this is a guy who ha was in the control room, had access to all the whole cards, has worked every job at Hustler Casino Live from top to bottom um, is, you know, so immediately everybody's like, oh, well, this is, you know, he's been, he's been telling Robbie that the hands, um, Robbie's been cheating and this is, he's taking his 15,000 because maybe she, he saw her give the money back to Garrett. Now she, he's like, well, she's not going to give him, give me the money. I'm going to have to go steal it off her stock. Anyway, all kinds of different scenarios that people were running through. Um, so, you know, <laughs> it just gets weirder and weirder. Like it's just a some giant soap opera every day. Uh, you know, it's just a different turn and everybody's sort of working in these confidence levels of, oh, did she cheat? Eh, I'm at 5% or I'm at 20%. And then this comes out and ah, now I'm at 80%. <laughs> so we go back and forth. And, you know, you, you mentioned Alex Jacob earlier and, and I think the world of Alex, he's a brilliant human and I loved watching him go on the run. But he's just so, he's one of these guys that's completely convinced. And Garrett on the other side too has, has said he's 100% sure that he was cheated. Alex is seemingly 100% sure that she wasn't cheating. And it's just fascinating to watch people in the community. Um, and I want to get your guys' take on this part. Uh, be either completely sure or complete or completely sure that she cheated or completely sure she didn't cheat. And I just don't know how we can get there at this point with the information we have. Terrence, uh, w w what's your swings been like? Yeah. Uh, well, my, sw my swings probably, I probably went from like, you know, if you're talking about, the very first time I saw the hand, I probably went from like 90 to like further analyzing it to 20 and then down to 10. And then I think I said on the podcast last week, it was probably below 10. And I think I, I think I even said it was like below 1% that, you know, she had sophisticated electronic equipment that was helping her had since, since then have to revise that you, you have to revise that upwards when you get new information. That's what you do. You have to, you have to revise I think Daniel and I said last week, the only wrong answers are zero and a hundred. Those are the only wrong answers. Anything else is sort of in play. I, and I would say, um, you know, this is a perfect example of, of why you just don't go zero to hundred because new information is going to come out that changes. And, and when, when I saw, uh, you know, the situ situation with, with uh, Brian Sagbasal taking 15 K off of her stack that rocketed up that the, the post certain, the, the possible overall possibility that she had cheated and, Obviously, definitely, given that I was below 1%, the possibility that she had sophisticated some some manner, she or somebody else had some sophisticated manner of cheating, because when you have somebody involved on the inside, that necessarily means that that has to go higher. Do I still think she's like a favorite to cheat? I, I, I lean slightly towards the no. I haven't been following every nuance um, of, of every story that, that came out. And there's all these now, there's, there's these side stories that involve lots of different characters and there's there's more of that but i'll say i'll say that i'm i'm you know and i think more people should say this more often that that i just i don't feel i have the information right now to make a to put out a confident number out there and i think unless you have literally watched every minute of everything and you've you've analyzed and you've dissected everything you shouldn't be terribly confident about uh, either side, one way or another, I think. Um, I think I understand, there, you know, the reason why Garrett is, you know, basically 100% sure is because he's motivated to find that reasoning. I, and I'm not saying that 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 Garrett is dumb, or but, he, but he's 
it's hard for him to look at this from an objective uh, perspective. And I, I think similar things go for people who are almost a hundred percent sure that, that Robbie didn't cheat. I, I think there's still a lot of nuance in play here. And I, and I think you, you shouldn't be too confident about your number and, you know, at any number, regardless of, of, of what it is, because you just don't have the information here. We're still going to find out a lot more, but yeah, it definitely went up since the last time we, we had this podcast. And it goes to show that, that my number was, was probably too small in, in the beginning. Okay. So really a lot of interesting stuff here. First and foremost, I want to make it clear that up to this point, we have no evidence of cheating. We have circumstantial thoughts and different things like that. So what we do have is we had this new information that came out. And I, as I said, I was playing super high roller bowl and, you know, boom, she stole this guy took 15 K off her stack. Looks bad. My first question is how much did she win that night? And rumor was 150,000. Well, that's a very suspicious number then to take 15 K if she won 150 K. So then you find out this guy has access to the whole cards in the control room. So if you if your number didn't change based on that information, you're not being genuine. You're not being true to yourself. There's no way that hearing that initially is going to affect what you think about the situation. Obviously it's not, you know, confirmed. And it's one of those things that you just look at and you go, hmm, okay. There's been other stuff too. Obviously, you know, the one thing we've talked about before on the podcast is there's no other hands, right? So we have no other hand evidence, but there was also some other evidence that sort of supports her side. I think really significantly, you know, Bill Perkins and Haralabos threw up $250,000 free roll, a, a, like come to any whistleblower, come forward, we'll give you 250,000 bucks to just roll on these guys and talk about cheating. You won't get in any trouble outside of that. So when you ask yourself, some guy taking 15K, you know, why would he turn down 250, right? It's like nobody took up the 250. In addition to that, there's an additional rumor that, or there's there's some suspicion that this player, th this man, Brian, stole off many people. He, he stole off stacks before. So that sort of like is evidence towards her. So there's always new evidence, as you said, Terrence. And every time you hear something new, you should factor it in. Is this, is this pro her case or you know, a, 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 like uh, anti her case, right? Now, she, her doing the lie detector test obviously is something that, you know, people argue the validity of. It's just a lie detector test. Who cares? But like, hey, if, if, it, if it helps any side, it certainly helps her side, even if it's marginal, right? The fact that she was willing to do it and did it and who knows what else. And ultimately, like I said, you know, we don't have evidence of cheating. I'm, I'm in, I'm going to just say it at this point. I'm in, I'm incredibly disappointed with Garrett's like doubling and tripling down here. And he put out a tweet and I want to read this. Cause this one's like, this tweet goes in the irony hall of fame. This one needs to be framed and be like, are you, ki are you kidding right now? It's a satire. He wrote, I'm as heartbroken and jaded as anyone, but that doesn't make it okay to destroy people's reputations without clear evidence. Unfortunately, going through hell myself last week, I would know. This is tr true not only of DJF, but various others on the HCL staff as well. Let's be better. Are you fucking kidding me? And then a whole bunch of people railed him in the tweets like, has anyone been more guilty of this than you specifically, right? I want to say this clearly. Whether she's guilty or innocent, regardless of what we find, everything about the way that he's handled this has gotten worse. It was somewhat excusable in the moment because you're like what the fuck just happened here you know this is awkward whatever but even then like to accuse a new player of cheating without evidence in that spot that's out over the line but you could probably apologize your way out of that you know and be like hey i'm sorry you know it's just a weird spot and i thought something was up and you know i don't have any evidence i apologize for doing that if you would have done that squash but that's not what happened he's doubled down la times all these circumstantial things without a single shred of what he calls what did he what does he define as clear evidence we have none so I'm mortified because all this happened because of him, right? Well, imagine just for a second, as we have before, imagine she's innocent. Look at what he's done to poker with this escapade. He's taken a new woman who's playing high stakes, just, just destroyed her reputation, called her a cheat or and a fish or whatever else is going on, right? If she's innocent. So like the lesson here, I think is like, anytime you have suspicions of this, learn how to handle it properly. And that's not to go on national TV without evidence and put this girl on blast. It made mainstream news, right? People like, is this good or bad for poker? That's not good. Cause what are they talking about? You have all these mainstream takes that it's like, Oh, it's sexism. It's this and that. It's like, it's insane. And really at the core, none of this would have happened. If he would have won one of the boards, if he just would have won one with seven, eight of clubs and they chopped the pot. 
no thing. If he wins both, nothing. And if he just didn't do that, if he just got up from the table, went to the back room, said to Andrew and Nick, like, guys, something's up here. That doesn't make no sense. Can you like do something? Because I think there's some cheating going on. But the way that you ha- he handled it in that regard is it's mind boggling that any that he's like still says, I'm proud of the way that I handled it. How could you ever be proud of this? Again, even if I'm saying this, even if we find out next week, nope, she cheated. Makes no difference. He made the, the accusation with, and we still don't have evidence, right? He made the accusation on just flimsy stuff. There's been a lot of people who have been calling for him to put it in escrow. And I think this is a thing that makes a lot of sense, really, which is like, you know, like he's he. But the thing is, he won't do it because he's 100 percent convinced like his number is 100. And, and you know, you can't talk somebody out of 100. Right. <laughs> like that, That's the problem. But the, the idea is the investigation is still ongoing. Maybe he doesn't have confidence that that HCL will will be able to come to any conclusion. But there, he he hasn't accepted one one thousandth of a percent probability that she might not have done this. And that's that's a real problem here, because, as you said, there there is you have to imagine the the possibility that she's innocent and all these terrible things that have happened. Like if, if she's innocent, you've essentially, I don't know if you want to say stolen 150,000, that's maybe a little bit too strong. You know, she gave you, you kind of, you, and he claims he didn't bully her. Okay. But he has to also look at the circumstances where he's this jacked up pro poker player who has star of the show. Yeah. yeah, on on his show, and you're this newcomer to this world, and you don't understand what's going on. Like at a minimum, the optics of the situation aren't very good. So, yeah, it's uh, it goes. I don't know if we're ever going to be able to find some real solution. I don't know how 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 this will come about. I don't know if there's enough video evidence, even if if Hustler has every inch of the entire set covered with video cameras. I don't know if they're ever going to be able to find it. I hope so. I hope we get, I do do hope we get some answers, but I think we do have to live with the possibility that we'll never find out. I will say this, and I'll say this on behalf of, because I did watch on uh, the Only Friends podcast, you know, Berkey and Nick Fertucci had a back and forth. There were some threats between the two, essentially. You know, Berkey sort of, I don't know if you, it came off to others as maybe holier than thou, the idea that like the stream needs to shut down, right? And, you know, the alternative argument against that is, listen, if nine people want to play, they understand the situation, we've amped up our security, we're wanding people, we're doing all these things. If nine people want to play, let them play. If you don't feel like it's safe, then you don't have to play. There's no, I don't think there's a responsibility, frankly, on them to do anything more than they've done, which is try to improve security. And Berkey was calling for them to shut down for like, and Nick is like, that's not going to happen. We'd have to shut down for months in order to do like the configural changes to the, um, the, you know, the actual construction that would need to happen to, to sort of up their security to another level. So since they've done everything they can, and it's, it sounded like to me, and a lot of people are giving Nick a lot of flack because he's on Twitter, in the streets, you know, maybe not handling himself perfectly in every case, but being really transparent, I think, and having answers for everything and like not really avoiding any questions, it sounds to me like, you know, Nick is, and Adam, Andrew, or whatever, are trying really hard to get to the bottom of this, but... You know, here's the thing is like when Stones, the thing happened with Mike Possible, they didn't say anything publicly. So people shit on him for not speaking, right? Because they just give these canned corporate answers of like, you know, we're investigating the situation and whatever. Whereas he's out there, you know, sharing it and, you know, people giving him shit for that. And so he came back with the Berkey thing because apparently, I don't know, Berkey recorded a conversation of theirs. So he tweeted None of them between him and, and somebody who works at us. Yeah. Now. So, so uh, Nick tweeted out something somewhat cryptic about, oh, speaking of integrity, because he's pissed. He didn't like the way, I guess, Berkey's tone was. And he came back at him with like, you, your integrity is going to jeopardy and blah, blah, blah. And it's about the fact that he did this because it is illegal to record someone against without their knowledge, California, Nevada or whatever. And Berkey claims that he didn't know that. I take him at his word. And so did Nick. Nick went on his podcast. I thought it was civil. I thought that Nick really, you know, I thought he, made his case very, very well. And I'm glad to see that they got to a civil place because we don't need that kind of, you know, bickering going on. But again, I just don't think it's like anyone else's position. It's almost like when Berkey said, I need to hire somebody to proofread my tweets. I'm like, bro, how about you fucking do you? I'll tweet what I want to fucking tweet, right? And I'm good with it. I'm me, bro. You know what I mean? I'm a tweet. But like to tell them how to run their business in this case is like, it sounds to me like if you listen to the, the things that Nick has been doing and he also opened up, the room for like Doug or Joey or Matt to look at. And apparently Matt was upset about that because he said it's another breach on, uh, you know, on the back end. And you can tell though, that like everything they're doing, as far as I'm concerned, comes from a place of like, 
you know, transparency and guys, look, we have nothing to hide. We're talking to anybody. And that goes again towards Robbie's innocence too. in a, in a separate conversation, she's answered every fucking question, drunk, sober, whatever. Like who's what cheater in the poker history or any cheater has been like that willing to just like without a lawyer or whatever, just go blah, 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 you know, and face every attack from people who actually think she's cheating. You know, it's like, I don't know, man, when people are willing to do that, Again, I think that goes in the bucket of, you know, less likely she's cheating. I, I think there are some things on Robbie's side that that there. I think there still are questions unanswered from the Robbie side. Um, you know, to defend Berkey a little bit, I agree he came off as super sanctimonious and it, to some extent continues to because he's he's just saying like, hey, you guy, it's it's very easy to to shut down somebody else's source of revenue and say you guys right. have to do this because you're not your security is not up to the standard that that I would like it has and I as an upstanding member of the poker community like I am fighting for justice and I'm putting on my cape and I'm you know I'm 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 going to make sure that I that I clean up the city the, the streets of Gotham City I mean Hustler Casino and and all this kind of stuff it's it's a it, he he has to have a little more self awareness to understand where it's coming from but but in the end his heart is in the right place he is looking out for the poker community, he is trying to, to flush out all the bad things, but to, for someone else to say like, Hey, you don't get to run a poker stream and you guys, you don't get to play on this poker stream. Yeah, I think obviously they both you can are see in that same place. I think that's the common ground. I really do think they're both trying to do what's best for poker. And you can understand why Nick was put off by that. Cause he's like, he probably, you know, internally he's like, fuck you, dude, I'm doing everything over here. And you're sitting there on your high horse, not, you know, just telling us how to run our business. That's probably the way it came off, but I was glad to see they handled the discussion civilly going forward. It was a little say, awkward I, by the end, but I come on team Berkey here a little bit because, um, you know, to the point about Nick coming out and doing everything and answering all the questions, but that doesn't absolve him from, from the things that he said and criticizing some of the stuff that he said. Right. So he comes out and says uh, in the past that he said, well, this is the most secure poker stream that, that's out there. And then we find out this guy, um, that stole the chips is, is a career criminal. And they didn't, and now they admit they didn't vet this guy at all. Meanwhile, he's had access to everything in a, in a game that has millions of dollars on the table. Right. So, um, you know, I, and, and, you know, maybe that's changed and maybe now he's like, Oh, we should have done this. We should have done that. We didn't do it, but Hey, we're going to run this, we're on this game. And Berkey, maybe it could have said it differently or could have been to your guys's point, a little san less sanctimonious about it, but Hey, can you prove to us, because this is does real damage to the poker community as large, if we have more ongoing issues with this, A, was this, you know, maybe Robbie wasn't cheating at all, and uh, but this guy's been cheating in the past. We don't know that. We now know that a convicted or, or a career criminal, I should say, um, who stole money currently has been in this booth and in this environment for quite some time. Yeah. This guy's you, you know the thing, though? I like, see, here's the thing. I, I get both sides, right? But like... So I, I do believe Nick is making a lot of efforts to improve the security of the, of, the, of the thing. But the question I think ultimately lies in this, like whose responsibility is it ultimately, right? If I'm a customer and I'm a poker player, right? And I choose to go on a stream, I do so because I have trust and I have faith in that they're going to do a good job to keep me safe, right? So I'm making that decision for myself under no false pretenses. I'm not being lied to. I'm just, they're telling me what I was. I have a choice to take them for their word or not. If nine people say that they trust it and they think it's good to go, How? why would anyone else have a say that should say, no, 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 guys, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do that because I don't trust it. You know what I mean? Like that's where it really just you know, crosses the line. And I think like, because I, I don't think Nick was resistant to the idea that he wants to up the security levels. But as he said on, on the podcast, he's like, that'll take months for us to redesign the entire place. In the meantime, we're doing everything else we can. And everyone knows about this thing, right? So would I feel sorry for you, Terrence, if you went on there, you know, and you got cheated? Sure. But like at the same time, you know, your decision to go. If, if Or like if, say, for example, I said to you, like, you know, Terrence, I don't know, man, they've had a bad history or whatever. And you're like, you know what? I'm fine with it. I'm going to go play. That's your right. Go play. I'm not going to, you know, I'll just to give you my thoughts. So Berkey has every right to go, guys, beware. Put it out publicly. You shouldn't play on the stream because I think it's, you know, not secure or whatever. And then people make the decisions for themselves. I'm always a big believer in letting them. I don't think it's on them as much as it is the people who, you know, who play. I don't, I don't, I don't need a, a nanny to protect me in those regards in terms of the decisions I make. 
Fair enough. Uh, moving on. Um, one other thing in sort of the uh, uh, not cheating or accusational type thing that went on in, in the poker world was Jeremy Osmus, who came second in the $7,777 World Series of Poker online event uh, that recently happened. And uh, he tweeted, oh, came, out, came up short, uh, second in the WSOP uh, 7777. Grats to Jared Strauss, who I'd never heard of. He definitely played the best at the final table. I look forward to battling him in the live high rollers, as it's obvious that's where he belonged, despite most of his live results being in the $60 South Point Birds. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously, you know, here. the joke around the high rollers is we all say, like, you know, Phil Helmuth brags about having the most bracelets, and that's just not true because Ali M. Shurovich, I think, has 34 now. <laughs> I think he has 34 bracelets. <laughs> oh, I, I heard people people straight up responded to like uh congrats ali on, on winning this yeah this no for sure better. now here like because jeremy was wondering like you know was he out of line with his tweet and all that kind of stuff and i don't think this is anything like you know the garrett thing it's a much more mild thing here's the issue we do know this is happening the herms of the world mark herms the ali's the jakes like we know that they are playing anonymous accounts and wsop security as of now in the united states um isn't as well isn't good okay they're not not doing a good job of uh you know policing this sort of thing but they are looking into this case now this case is a little interesting because as you said this guy's results are all from like small tournaments he does have one cash in a 5k live right so there's like okay well this guy does play whoever it is he's played a 5k um the question is would he play in a 7700 dollars buy-in online which is typically going to be a little it's bit a big tougher. difference yeah it's a little different than like a 5k at venetian or something like that that's like 400 people so you know i guess i i think it's like it's it's good that we point this stuff out because we should be able to parse this through like you know what i mean like a, according to jeremy this guy was playing like really good like better than him and jeremy's a top player in the world and he was like on point like gto like really perfect icm and everything like that so it's suspicious and i don't have a problem with looking into suspicious stuff like this as long as we do so with kid gloves you know um and, you know, this one has just a lot more. Again, this has more evidence to it because you have a resume with this. With the Robbie thing, guys, if we break it down, guys, all this shit is over one fucked up hand. Mm -hmm. This isn't thousands of hours of Mike Postel doing it over and over and over. This isn't an online track record where you can see this guy's graph in $40 tournaments over an extended period of time. This is one fucking hand that just makes no sense. The hand is bonkers, and it might just be that it's bonkers, maybe that it's cheating, but how dare you besmirch somebody without knowing for sure? That's all I got to say. I want to talk about this Jared Strauss thing more because there's there's a lot to it. Daniel mentions that he did play a, a 5K WPT, so there's some evidence that, that you know, maybe he's not just a guy who plays – the $60 at South Point, but the vast majority of his caches are $60 at some point. A lot of the conversation revolved around this. If you, if you sort of read the replies, there are a lot of pros saying what Daniel said, that, that we know this is a problem. We know that there are people out there multi-accounting and ghosting random anonymous accounts um, to play big buy-in online tournaments at WSOP Nevada in the United States. The, the rest of the comments are from i guess i'll say recreational poker players or players that i haven't heard of who are saying oh this is just a this is just another pro whining this is a pro whining that you know some recreational player got lucky i'm here to point out you know daniel i'm sure you back me up you know jeremy as well this is this is not this is not jeremy osmus being a fucking sore loser no chance. Be, be, this is not that's not who he is like that this, he doesn't this care is, about that kind of money and he's the classiest guy in poker. You're right. You know, he's he's a very he's a very classy, honest dude. And and if he and if he if this was a guy who was just like randomly clicking buttons and just fucking won the all in every single time, like you know what's what Daniel claims has been happening to him, he just can't win an all in. <laughs> if this was a guy who was just clicking buttons and just got the luckiest sun run of all time in online poker history, Jeremy would be the first guy to say, "Well, fuck, what are you gonna do?" Like so the thing is, like on WSOP in the United States. It's such a small player pool. Everybody yeah. knows everybody. We all know everybody. So when you see an account coming out of the blue, you know, Bill Ohio 7744, 
And all of a sudden, Bill Ohio is fucking hitting all the GTO. He knows all the sizes on every yeah. every texture. He's, he's got the playing. he's got the right bet size every time. How does that happen? Perfect. We're smart enough to know that you know you got to look into that. But I wanted to mention one other thing as a sidebar because we're talking about the WSOP. WSOP.ca launched in Ontario. W, so WSOP in Ontario, powered by GG Software. So this is like a totally different animal. I saw in PokerFuse that it's already bigger than any than the United States network in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And within just a week, you know, thanks to some you know promotion from our from our side, we you know BetMGM has been there for a while, as has Stars. We're number one in the market in like a week. You know, we ran some circuit ring events there in WSOP. And just so people aren't confused, WSOP Ontario is running the GG Poker software. Yes, they are, which is yeah. obviously, you know, as I've said before, in my opinion, you know, the absolute best software. But it's, it's amazing to see how big Ontario is when you think about, you know, the United States, including, you know, several states. But Ontario is pretty massive as a, as a market, bigger than uh, all the rest. Yeah, they're off to an awesome start, which is always good to see as, as Canadians. But yeah, I mean, it was just, I wanted, I was so surprised by I, I, guess I shouldn't say surprise because the thing is, I think that if you were, if you're like a recreational poker player in 2022, it's easy to think like, ah, oh, these, these pros, like they're just all about themselves. You know, can't, can't, can't a sucker get lucky one time. And that used to be, that used to be the thing in, in poker is like, if a sucker got lucky, you just, you just shake their hand. Uh, and you say, he's in there limping and shit. He's in limping and making it four X like I would, then he's a fucking sucker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we know that's not the case. Just like you, you got to trust that the professional poker players, like they understand a guy coming completely out of nowhere to to like play perfectly just every street. Oh, that's a turn card. That's a good turn card for me. I'm a fire at that one. Like just every time. And, you know, if if again, we always got to hold out the possibility that we're wrong, just like the Robbie Lou case. There could be the possibility that, that Jared Strauss is actually just a super crusher who never leaves his house other than to play the $60 South Point tournaments. We got to consider that's that's possible. He hopes that he just starts showing up in the high rollers and starts yeah, beasting people. And if he does come out there and start beasting people, Jeremy Osmus is going to owe him a nice solid apology. I'm going to be I'm sure you do. Come with it. Today as we record this, the uh, it started already, but I'm going to be playing the 10k WSOP online with one rebuy, which is a big one. It'll be a small field. I'm not going to Bellagio to play this 25k online or live one. There was like nine people or something like that. But I've sort of been in two camps since I've been home, either playing the online or the live for two different reasons. Obviously, you play the online to try to win bracelets, but I'm also in this PGT leaderboard thing. And uh, you know, these count like any 10k and above. And I'm like, it's the top 21 who qualify. And it's going to be a really cool tournament, the PGA Championship, the PGD Championship at the end of the year. Only the top 21 qualify based on points. And I'm right on the cusp. I know that what I have right now won't be enough because there's going to be a lot of points given out for this big event coming up here. Um, so that's why I've been grinding these like cheesy little eight to 10 player fields. Hopefully I put a, a good score together in the Bellagio. But this is interesting. I know we're, 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 I'll just lead into it. Bellagio has a five million guarantee, boys. Based on the numbers you've seen before, yeah. What do you think? <laughs> tough, tough. Yeah, uh, a ten thousand dollar buy-in, unlimited rebuys. I think until level ten, if I remember right. Correct. Um, but five million seems like it's going to be hard to hit. I think with the rebuys, and I mean, it would. The issue is, it's a different time of year, right? The Bellagio is usually in December, but I think the win has sort of taken over that time slot, and people love playing at the win. And a lot of people who may be thinking about making one trip, maybe thinking win versus this one. But I do think the unlimited rebuys makes it where, you know, I think there's a decent chance that, uh, I mean, 500, that, that's a lot less than they've had in past years, I think. Yeah, be interesting to see. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, well, you know, the World Pro Tour, I, I think their branding helps them a lot. And and uh, there's a lot of people that chase that. So we'll see. I mean, uh uh, the series. How's the series gone so far? Right, we're we're coming up to the main event. Uh, I haven't looked back to see how the five the uh, previous. Oh, they're, they're, uh, I just mentioned they're these are the, the high rollers all week are at Bellagio and they're part of the series. And I think today they're got nine players. Yesterday, you know, like eighteen, twenty. They're they're not getting over twenty five players. Yeah, Daniel, Daniel posted the lineup for the the PLO sit and go uh, yesterday. <laughs> yeah, that was like by far the worst tournament I've ever seen, especially for PLO. Like you have like all really good players. Uh, a couple, a couple of people showed up later that are not top pros, but it was pretty funny to see, you know, the lineup and all of them have been kind of similar to that. Not, uh, not great. Yeah. And again, I, I'm like wondering what, like, 
if you was at Pokergo Studio, you'd have twice as many people, right? So people like people do care. Like I I didn't enjoy it. Like it was hot. Where the tables are too, super cramped. You don't have side tables. You're right next to the slot machines. I went up to Paul because he was helping to run, and I asked for. I made a simple request. Okay, I made a simple request. We're near the rail. I said, "Can we just do one of a couple things? Can we turn the slot machines? Can we turn the volume off and kill the lights? And also in the sports book area, can we just have those people move to a different bar? Right? Is that so much to ask as a patron at Bellagio? Yeah, especially at that price point. Like you know, you what you're you're not trying to. <laughs> I'm kidding, attract- by the way. <laughs> you're, you're not trying to attract the pros like the, like as we point out the pros will show up anyway but you're trying to attract people who are used to a certain lavishness when they're putting yeah i mean they have bobby's in. room during the day there was three tables in bobby's room there was nobody in there and they have the high limit section there's three tables there but they put us like way in the corner all cramped it's just like it's like it's basically like we're an afterthought kind of thing which is whatever you know you don't care about us we don't make you a lot of money that's fine but these same group of people we're treated like really really well when we go to poker go studio and and when we went to the win, and even the Venetian, frankly, when we played there, You're going was, you know, nice on the internet. but Berlajo was like, what the hell? This is like, this it feels like we're right next to the one and $2 game. So I got grandma Betty on my lap, checking out my cards as I'm lo- as I'm squeezing, you know, it's a little much. And maybe the WPT should move to the Orleans for next year. Be a way to do it. Would be an upgrade. <laughs> All right. Let's get on some tweets for us. Going surfing on the internet. All right, Robert Miss Rachi tweets out. This is my theory. I believe she called with Jack Four because if she wins, she keeps the money. If she loses, she tells Garrett, "Oh my God, I misread my hand. I thought I had Jack Three and I can get my money back." Total genius. That's pretty funny. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Haralabos Vulgaris, Haralabob, who's now known as Harry Potter, uh, <laughs> because Robbie has deemed him to be uh, Harry Potter. Poker should just go back to whole card cameras after you fold or the hand is over, you show your cards to the camera. All these shows are on a 30 to 45 minute delay, more than enough time to add everybody's whole cards to the stream and protect the integrity of the game. Um, thoughts on that, guys? Uh, thoughts if that's sort of a reasonable solution to to the security issue? I mean, I think, like, I'm a, I'm a security guy. Like, I, you know, when we talk about the the, the Berkey versus Ricciucci thing, like, I, I mean, for as much as I... You know, I, I think Berkey is a little over the top in this stuff. I lean towards the integrity side being the most important part of the pie. So I like the idea. However, I understand why it's not likely to happen because, you know, they like they like production to look a certain way. And when you when you're adding more stuff in there, like you know, have you have to manually add the whole cards after the hand, then you you miss out on a lot of stuff. Like the commentators can't talk about the cards that have been folded like it, it there's just a lot of it's not as easy to do well, he was it, doesn't, it doesn't create such a good a good a product at the end of the day but but you know if if scandals like this continue to come out you know this is maybe the safer way to do it well he was suggesting that on for this for delay streams right so right. if you're on an hour delay you would have enough time to get all the cards so it would look similar right I, now i see the idea i'm like sure fine but like it feels to me like overkill because I don't think like the rep, I mean, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a huge problem. I think the stones was a really small operation. Postal found a guy on the ends. I think there's other ways in which you can like, you make sure that, uh, you know, your games are safe without going to that extent. Um, but you know, it's fine. It, you know, it is what it is. I don't find it a problem. Like when I don't, I have no qualms or no concerns at all. When I play streams on poker, go studio or at the world series of poker, like I feel really, confident in what they do and i also listen guys i feel really confident in the poker community i feel confident enough that if somebody's doing shit we will catch them and this is partly why too i think joey is on hour 765 and we're still on no evidence here in this robbie case and i just think the reason for that is it very unlikely happened you know and i did too like you said when the new information came out i'm like oh whoa this could be a smoking gun we have to look at it right you know not just be like poo poo everything and then i agree with terrence wholeheartedly like 100 or zero you're you're not in you're not in the realm of you're not being realistic you know you want to be right so badly and i think that's one of the worst things that came with something like this is whatever side people are on it's like ego now like they just want to be right like it's not about finding the truth they just be like oh yeah you're stupid you said t like berkey did that to me like he i asked during during the sub super high roller bowl thing like i said i wasn't following so i tweeted out i was like can anyone give me some cliffs, you know, on what's going on? And he goes, you're probably wrong. End thread. <laughs> like, 
I don't fuck. Okay, great. Thanks for your fucking help. But it's like, he doesn't get it. Like he doesn't understand how condescending arrogant that is. Right. Cause he can be, he can get to go down the, the, those streets too sometimes, but that's what the tweet is. Right. What I asked a simple question. Let me know what's up. Yeah. You're, you're likely wrong. End thread. Thanks. Come on, Burke. You could do better. Than that. It's kind of like your take uh, on Aiden Hill versus Logan Thompson. I mean, I don't know what Logan Thompson needs to do. The guy stood on his head for like every game that he's been put oh, in yeah, there. He played against fucking ooh, Chicago. Oh boy. Wow. The Blackhawks. <laughs> what a team that is. eh? Let's see him play against Calgary tonight. We'll see how it goes. Can you tell I got Logan Thompson in my pool? <laughs> Good, I might pick up Aiden Hill. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Thanks for getting together uh, again. Uh, good luck at the uh, at the WPT Five Diamond, Daniel. Uh, make, make, get some points. Pick up some points. Solidify yourself in that top twenty-one uh, for the PG, PGT Championship. And uh, I'm gonna win this one too, guys. I'm gonna win the Five Diamond. Go, nice. Done it before. I'm gonna win it. Mark my all words. Right. I'll be number one on the WPT All-Time Money List again after this tournament. Uh, all right, boys. Thanks to get, uh, for getting together. Thanks everybody out there for listening, and we will talk to you soon. See ya. Later, Bye -bye. guys.